Hi, everyone. It's Alan Thornton, President and CEO of St. John's Community Services, and uh, you're back for another episode of Advocates for All. And I'm thrilled today because I have a very special guest, Jason Tiriano. He is the Executive Director of Inkulu Leco. Jason, uh, welcome, and thank you so much for uh, getting up. This is probably the earliest episode I've ever done, <laughs> so I appreciate your willingness to do that. It's really, really good to see you. Thanks for having me on. It's really great to be here. So Inku Leco, um, why don't you kind of take a second and explain what that is, what that is as an organization, and we can talk about how we met, but I'd love sure. for people to understand Inku Leco. Sure, Inku Leco is a nonprofit organization that works with young people in South Africa, in the Eastern Cape province of South Africa. We help young people to finish high school and either move on to university or to be equipped with a skill set so they can pursue a career of their choice upon graduation. So we provide transport to our space. This is all pre-COVID. We can talk about what we're doing now, but uh, transport to our space, access to high-speed wireless internet, a library of books, tutoring. We also have a social enterprise unit that helps our learners to build business skills uh, while they're still in high school. So we've been operating. We're going into our 10th year uh, next year. And we're really grateful for what the, the future has in store. Despite the uncertainty, we're, we're excited about some of the forward momentum we've, we, we've garnered over the last few years. And if I remember correctly, you founded Inkululeko. I mean, when I saw, I think the very first time I saw you, you were uh, connected at Syracuse University at the time. Yeah. And I think yeah. you were speaking about launching this organization and you were getting students from the university that were interested in supporting it and they would travel over to South Africa and then work with leadership on the ground there and get this off the ground. You've come a long way in 10 years, but is that, am I remembering that correctly? You are, yeah. I think that is the first time that we met was in, I think it was in a Whitman class at, at the university. And we were trying to figure out a way to link Syracuse University in a mutually beneficial way with uh, what we were doing in South Africa. So this, this program in Whitman decided to create a study abroad program. We've been running it every year with the exception of this year. For the last 10 years, we've brought over 100 students and faculty from the university to work with uh, our young people and our colleagues in South Africa. And what I would argue is a really mutually beneficial partnership. So pre-COVID, um, it, you would literally be over there for weeks, months at a time, right? You would travel over to South Africa and then you were working with a team over there. Tell us a little bit more in depth about the programs that you were doing and then also the social enterprise component of that, how that worked. Sure. So I would go a few times a year to South Africa and I would stay anywhere between a few weeks and a few months. Uh, so I was there three or four times a year. The last time I was there was in February, which was prior to the world sort of imploding. And, uh, you know, this began really as a response to uh, being able to provide opportunity for, for young people. Um, we feel that our learners are able to, to achieve at the same levels of learners from more affluent backgrounds. The difference is opportunity, and we seek to provide that opportunity for our young people. I was saying before we got on the call today, before we started recording this, that South Africa, according to the World Bank, is the world's most unequal nation, according to socioeconomic distribution of, of, of resources. And so we work to provide opportunity. Young people come to us uh, after school. We are a program after school, not in place of school. So the young people go to school during the day. They come to us several days a week after school, where we provide, as I said, access to tutoring, um, a library of books, Wi-Fi, uh, and a variety of other resources, snacks, and we, we take learners to and from uh, our space. We also, a few years into this, realized that not all of our learners are either wanting to go on to university or bound uh, or, or have an, an opportunity because of their grades to go on to university. So we thought, what are we going to do with these young people who have something to contribute, but maybe it isn't university attendance either isn't a possibility or isn't something that they want to do. So we created something called Common Ground Cafe. It's a repurposed storage container that was donated by the Rotary Club in South Africa. This uh, John Ben Snow Memorial Trust in Syracuse gave some money to outfit the cafe. A few foundations in Syracuse also gave money to build a business skills curriculum for us. And the cafe has been operating for the last several years with learners, you know, learning in the classroom about math and seeing how that math can be applied to profit margins and running an actual business. And they do that in collaboration with the local social entrepreneur. 
That is um, super cool. I love the sound of that. I, I hope to actually see it physically in person one day. Um, okay, so COVID hits, right? So everything changes. Mm -hmm. How have you adapted? Because um, you really almost pivoted your entire program model, right? I mean, just you're here, the operation and the programs are in South Africa. Yeah. Um, you, this is pretty inspiring. Talk to me about what you did to kind of keep everything moving forward and, and changing and adapting. Well, the first thing I did, I should note, and something that I've learned, and I'll maybe talk about this after I answer this question, is um, I've learned from people along the way, and you are one of those people that I've learned from along the way because you have uh, been a mentor to me, and, I, and I'm really grateful for that. The, uh, you know, our world imploded like everybody else's did when this happened, and we had to shift what we were doing, and we had to rather dramatically switch courses. Our program is based in a community that has a ton of assets and a ton of opportunity. But one thing it does not have is a lot of high-speed wireless internet and access to data. And so when you shift everything online and you have massive socioeconomic divisions in a country, uh, this exacerbates the problem. Uh, you know, learners from more affluent backgrounds, learners who came from backgrounds, at least that I did, I could have gone home, I would have gone on my computer and I would have carried on about my life. Um, our learners often do not have that opportunity. So as a team, uh, there are seven people in South Africa. I'm in this country, and our board of directors is half South African, half American. Uh, we sat down, we thought, how can we continue to add value to our learners' lives despite everything that's going on in the world right now? So we decided that, you know, a main part of our program was providing academic support for young people. And so we shifted the support online. I should note that there's two iterations of this. The first iteration did not work the way we wanted it to. And so we struggled. We hit a number of potholes and we said uh, in one of our team meetings, guys, this isn't working. What are we doing wrong? And I think something that I am grateful for is I think we have created a, an environment at Inkuduleko where it is okay to take a calculated risk and sometimes not succeed. So we did, we took a calculated risk on this first iteration of the tutoring program. It, it didn't work, Alan, it was, it was not a success. And we sat down and we said, what can we take away from this that didn't work? And we discovered there were a few things. One, learner access to data was a very real issue. So we both got some additional funding from a few foundations. We shifted some of what we were doing. So we used to provide transport to our program. We don't have to do that anymore. So we can shift some of that funding to provide data. Um, we also discovered that, um, you know, the times that we were offering tutoring weren't terribly conducive to what our learners needed. So we shifted those, those timetables. Um, and then we also got people from around the world, from Newark, New Jersey, to Manhasset, to Johannesburg, South Africa. We had a number of people that had skill sets in subject areas that our learners wanted to, to, to improve upon. And we were able to, on the second iteration, make a much more impactful, much more effective tutoring program. And if we didn't have the team in place to do that, and if we didn't have, I don't think, the willingness to sit down and say, and, and create a space where we could say, this actually did not work the first time, how can we shift that? I don't think we'd be where we're at today. So that's huge. Um, you know, we talked before about how at St. John's, we're using enabling technology and remote support to help people particularly during the pandemic, continue their therapies, stay connected to family members. And, and what you're touching on, you know, it's interesting, and this has come up before, is a lot of people think about technology as it makes our lives more convenient, it makes things more efficient. Um, our mission at St. John's is advancing inclusive communities where every person, regardless of circumstance, has the right and opportunity to live their best life. And what you're talking about kind of fits into that so well, because it is about rights and opportunity. It's not about efficiency for the individuals that are your learners. It's about creating opportunity. And so you're using and leveraging technology and bringing it to them in a way that allows them to continue learning um, how they can best learn and, and hopefully grow and develop and create opportunity out of that. So there's such a, an affinity there for the work that you're doing. You also touched on though, uh, leadership and teamwork and, and being able to adapt, uh, especially during an unpredictable and historic time. 
you know, you're leading, a, you know, an organization that's global, you know, you're headquartered here, but your, your team, half your team, your board is in South Africa. Talk a little bit about the principles you've learned and, and what you've had to, to do as an organization or make sure that you're capable of doing in order to keep everything going. You, you talked about the ability to pivot, but what other things yeah. are really critical? I think one of the things is, so as I said, next year we're going into our 10th year of operation. We've certainly had some very real successes along the way, and we've had some shortcomings as well that we've had to sort of figure out and navigate uh, our way around. Uh, one of the first things that I think for me th that has been important is recognizing that, um, you know, I don't know everything and going into things with a very humble spirit because I, you know, am super grateful and very passionate about the work that Nkululeko does. I am also a white guy who was raised rather comfortably in upstate New York and do not have the lived experience that a lot of my colleagues have. I know that, they know that, and I go into um, our meetings often very curious about why things, um, you know, why we should do things the way that we do. And I have tried to create an environment again where, firstly, um, if we try something and it doesn't work, that we are comfortable enough with each other to be vulnerable and to say this didn't work and, and here's why. The second thing that I think we have really tried to do is I'm a very strong proponent and I believe very, very strongly uh, in, I think if someone takes care of their mental health, they'll often be able to take care of a lot of other aspects of their life and show up for people in ways that they would not be able to if their mental health was not in, in check. And so we really encourage our colleagues to, um, if they're having a rough day, take a mental health day. Do not be afraid to take a vacation. I was on, you know, not that long ago, I went away and hiked in the woods for a week and I, I did not check my email when I was there. And we encourage our colleagues to do the same because I feel like if you are able to take care of that facet of your life, you are able to show up for the people that you care about and you're able to show up at work uh, in, a, in a more effective way. Um, you know, the third and sort of final thing is we're very intentional with, um, you know, our board. Our board is half South African, half American. Um, we have people that um, come from a wide variety of backgrounds. We have a few people who um, are from the community that we operate in. Um, I think if you're not very careful and very intentional, a lot of times nonprofit boards can look a lot like me. And I think if you are not intentional with finding folks that can provide other sorts of lived experiences uh, on the board, um, then you're getting a very one-dimensional look of how things can, can sort of operate. And we've been I think very intentional with creating um, a board that truly does reflect the community that we operate in. Yeah, those are all um, amazing points. And I know when coming to St. John's, you know, my experience was I walked into a, a very inclusive organization and the DNA right. and culture was much more diverse than what I was accustomed to. And it was, it has been a great learning experience for me and something that I've really grown from as a result of that. And um, I agree, we have spent a lot of time, especially through the pandemic, um, talking about mental health and talking about self-care and really, you know, putting a high priority on that. Um, because, you know, this is such a stressful time in so many different ways. And it's, it is important that you step away and, and just kind of take stock of yourself, take some time for yourself, uh, make sure that you're, you're doing things that give you life, right? And, and help restore kind of your energy and bring your, your centeredness back. So um, again, I think connecting on that point. Um, let's, last couple of minutes here, Jason, you and I have a, a great connection. Um, you know, we met probably, how many years ago was it? Six, had, eight years? Maybe seven or eight years ago, I think. It was when you were in, you were the CEO of another organization in, in Syracuse. Uh, yeah, and, and you reached out to me, and yeah. I had seen you speak um, before. I was super impressed. And so I got back to you. You wanted to get together for a cup of coffee. And out of that, we kind of created this unique relationship that has kept us in touch, you know, periodically over the years. It's been really cool. Yeah, so I remember actually two two specific interactions prior to my reaching out to you. And the first was, uh, there was a, some sort of fundraising uh, event in Syracuse and the person who was working in development at the, the nonprofit that you were at spoke and you also spoke about the importance of having that partnership between development and the CEO. And I was super impressed with that. And I went back 
And I was talking to my colleague, Bethany, and I said, you know, this, he seems so interesting and I feel like I could learn so much from him. I said, I'm thinking about reaching out to him, but like, he doesn't know me. I don't know if I'm going to do it. And then we had a second uh, event. And I remember it was a, it was a collaboration between uh, the organization that you were at and the organization that I was at. It was a movie night. And I remember seeing you come in. And this is the sort of thing I feel like with, with leadership, um, you don't know sometimes who's watching and the impact that you're having on them. But I remember your development people um, brought stuff in. They were setting everything up. And at the end of the event, you, Mr. CEO, helped take down the stuff with the development people. And I thought, no, this is somebody that I really want to learn from because he's humble. He, uh, I, I thought he was, I thought you were really smart when you spoke. And I, when I saw you do that, I actually said to, to, to my colleague, I said, no, I am going to reach out to him. He probably won't respond, but I'll reach out. And you surprised me and you did. And we met for coffee and I have learned so much from you over the years. And you did not need to respond to me and you did. And I am so grateful for the, the wisdom and the lessons that you have imparted along the way for me. Uh, it's, I hope that everybody can find an Alan that can sort of help uh, detangle and, and answer questions that they have uh, along the way. Okay, well, that's really kind and very humbling. Um, I sure. appreciate that a lot. I have found life in our conversations because I found you to be this passionate leader that was trying to do the very best he could to get his organization really going and building sustainability and was very creative in your approach. And what you said earlier, the humility, um, you go into conversations looking to learn. And, and I think that, you know, you epitomize, I think what we all should be striving for is, you know, how can I learn so that the mission of the organization can really be fully achieved? And now when I hear you, you know, how many years later, and like you're experiencing continued success, you're continuing to stabilize through a period of tumultuous time. You've got this amazing team in place. Your board is kind of growing to be where you are hoping and, and empowered to really support and, and uh, govern the organization. It's really remarkable. I, I'm so excited to have been a small part of your journey. Um, and I really want to thank you, Jason, because I think, again, of all the principles you brought up today, you know, about leadership, about self-care, about depending on your teammates, but I think also about helping each other along, mm -hmm. you know, and, and you never know who you could potentially impact and what they could go on to do. I'm curious, who are you? Like, you know, not necessarily go by names, but are you engaging kind of that next generation of leadership as well? And, and are you cultivating their growth and development? Yeah, I'm trying to, and I, I should note sort of, I followed the, so, so firstly, if there was a Yelp review for people, I'd give you five stars, Alan. You were very, very helpful for me. I think that's the highest on Yelp. I don't think it's 10, I think it's five. Um, and we have worked with a number of, so we do, we do have uh, colleagues in South Africa that I have worked to sort of, hopefully mentor along the way. But there are also a number of folks in this country, students from Syracuse University. We've worked with students from Syracuse, from the University of Michigan, from Fordham, from Columbia. And, you know, folks that have come that have uh, assisted us in one way or another, it has often turned into sort of a mentoring uh, relationship. And some of them um, have become friends. Something that I was really grateful for is, and this is somebody that I think will transition to a friend. She was, um, an intern when she was doing her graduate work uh, at New York University. She uh, interned with Inkululeko and then she got a, uh, a job in the Peace Corps and she was actually deployed to, she went to South Africa. Um, very short lived because of coronavirus, everything shut down and she was sent home. And when she got back, she, uh, she reached out to me and said, you know, I don't have a job right now. I love South Africa. Can I come back and assist in some way? She did it through, through the whole summer and she just recently got a job in the State Department. Uh, I'm so proud of her. And I think this is something that will we'll continue to be friends. I'm not surprised by her success, but it was really humbling for me to have her come back and say, can I help in some way? I still care about South Africa. I still care about Nkululeko. And she did, and she made a huge, she actually helped um, uh, us in a, in a myriad of ways and helped sort of mentor newer folks um, with our organization.
That is super cool. You know, you think about like the seeds that you plant and what they could, you know, turn into one day. So um, Jason, I'm looking forward to the next time we get together and actually get to share a cup of coffee again, you know, <laughs> and a conversation in person. Um, but thank you so much for taking the time this morning and thank you for all that you're doing to, to really ensure that people have opportunity to live their best life. And you truly are an advocate and a friend and I'm just so grateful for you. So thank you so very much for joining us today. It's a pleasure. Thanks for having me and really appreciate all that you have done uh, for me as well, Alan. So thank you.